So uh, thank you all for attending. As I'm sure you're all noticing on the on the schedule uh, that I am, you know, Joe Salerno is supposed to give this talk. I am not Joe Salerno, uh, but I am someone else from New, New Jersey, so that makes me qualified uh, to speak about this. So I'm 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 happy to uh, discuss uh, calculation in socialism. So this is a very very important topic in Austrian economics. So. As, as I always uh, enjoy doing, I, I, I like to give a sort of an overview slide. Um, <clears throat> so I want to discuss a defining feature of Austrian economics. Right? So we, we've learned a lot about Austrian economics so far. We, we know we, we've discussed praxeology, logical deduction. We've discussed entrepreneurship, the capital structure. Uh, later today, we're going to be discussing Austrian business cycle theory, one of my favorite topics. Um, but uh, for this lecture, I want to discuss the importance of economic calculation for capitalism, uh, the difficulties of a mixed economy when it comes to economic calculation, and uh, the impossibility of socialism because of the problems related to economic calculation, the inability of a socialist society to engage in economic calculation. Okay, we're going to unpack uh, these definitions, right? Well, what I mean by capitalism, socialism, and so on. And we're going to be talking about economic calculation uh, in more depth, but I would like to just start off with the definition just so we know uh, where we all stand. We're all on the same page. Economic calculation uh, means allocating scarce means according to the monetary returns generated in various production processes. Right. That's, that's, that's really what it means uh, when, when we boil it down. So it's, it's allocating resources according to profit and loss, allocating resources according to the, uh, the, the, the revenue you'll earn, and, and so on. We all engage in economic calculation, whether or not we are an entrepreneur in the sense of running a business. Right? Um, I'm sure all of you part of uh, one of the... Um, uh, one of the inputs deciding that, that you've, you've thought about when deciding what you're going to major in in college is, well, how much money can I make when I graduate? All right. Uh, I, I, I love medieval history, but uh, unfortunately, uh, there, I could work at medieval times or I could work at a museum. And while I love medieval times, I, I, just, I just don't have the skill to be a knight. Right? But so I, I decided I'm going to be an economist instead. This is a very, very important um, uh, 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 sort of defining characteristic of Austrian economics, right? This, this issue of economic calculation, only really the Austrian school emphasizes this point. And this is because economic calculation is indispensable for human civilization. And I, I really don't want to, I'm really not exaggerating that, is, is quite indispensable for uh, civilization. Because the choice between capitalism, a system of the, or the means of production, the factors of production are privately owned. Uh, in socialism, a system where the factors of production are owned by one owner, the government, uh, is really a choice between life and death. Right? <laughs> capitalism works. Socialism, in the most strict definition of communism, and we're talking about that where there's no money, everything's owned by the government, does not. It's, uh, it's a choice between economic progress and economic collapse, all right? So uh, as, as we'll see, a lot of economists would talk about some of the incentive problems in a socialist society, and those are very important, and we won't neglect those, but really the, the fundamental problem is one of economic calculation. It is one of uh, which system can actually estimate the opportunity cost, the foregone alternatives, of the means of production. Right? And this is something that Mises uh, first made in, um, in the 1920s, and then uh, you know, later on in the famous socialist calculation debates of the 1930s and early 1940s. So really uh, a defining uh, feature of Austrian economics. Okay. All right, so in order to explain this, I want to talk about two types of people in society, engineers, and entrepreneurs, right? We've learned a lot about uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, many of you uh, are take, have taken classes on entrepreneurs. Maybe want to go to grad school for entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurship. I, I assume I think there are some of you who are majoring in engineering or want to become an engineer. But uh, this is, uh, you know, if, if you came to Auburn <laughs> at the end of July and early August to learn about engineering uh, and types of technology and so on, you've come to the wrong place, right? 
Uh, this is this is not what this week is about. But we can of course talk. We can give a little economic analysis of the engineer, right? So what do I mean by economics? Well, economics, as we all know, is the science of human action, right? We use means to achieve ends, okay? To we have a felt uneasiness, and we try to use uh, means to satisfy, uh, the, to alleviate. Uh, the, une the uneasiness to satisfy um, uh, our, our goal, you know, satisfy our ends, accomplish goals, and so on. So a very important problem in economics is how to allocate scarce means among competing ends. Okay, this is sometimes known as the Robinsian uh, economic problem. It comes from Lionel Robbins, so a fellow uh, Austrian traveler at various points in time. Um, you have scarce means, you only have so many means to satisfy your ends, right? So uh, we have to concentrate on the means. We don't live in a world of utopia where things just fall from the sky. Things just, our ends are mad at magically satisfied. Uh, we can't, we, 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 not everything is like air where we just sort of, we don't even think about it, right? We have to constantly think about the means and how we are going to allocate them. All right, so the technological problem is what is the most physically productive way of allocating means? Right. Uh, along some sort of benchmark of physical productivity, speed, durability, output, and so on. Right. What is the fastest way to transport goods, say, to the state of New York or New York City? Right. We've got a we've got a, a, a picture here of a you know some sort of freight train. It's carrying um, uh, <laughs> it's it's carrying cargo. Uh, it's, it's not exactly mountains of New York, but we can imagine it's 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 far away and it's it's, it's got to go to New York. Right? What's the fastest way? Is it, is it through a train? Is it by train? Is it by plane? Right? Is it by a, a boat around, you know, through the Panama Canal or something like that? Right? What is the most durable way to build a bridge? Right? We've all seen this uh, as we go past the highway or whatever. We see these huge, uh, you know, all this construction equipment, all this cement, all these other tools constructing a, a bridge or something for the for the interstate highway system. Uh, and so on, uh, you know, what's the most durable way that will last the longest, that will be the safest? Do we use concrete and steel? Do we use wood? Do we use bricks? Um, you know, what are the machines we use to make sure everything is fastened correctly? We don't want the bridge collapsing in a year or two, and so on, right? So these, these are all technological questions. Uh, what's the best way to maximize iPad production, right? Apple produces iPads Right, the you know the, hopefully we all know and love. Uh, what's the best way to maximize iPad production? Is it through some sort of assembly line process that's very labor intensive, or are we using more automation machines that will then be able to uh, you know insert the computer chips and and install everything correctly and and so on? Or is it some mixture? Right, if we want to maximize iPad production over the next year, what are we going to do? Right. All of these, we could say, they can be solved by the engineer, right? At least just these basic questions of, I, I, I don't know the fastest way to transport goods to New York City. I don't think any economist really knows that from their, their skill set as an economist, or what's the best way to construct a bridge or a road? What's the best way um, to maximize iPad production, right? Questions of speed, durability, uh, production, those are, we could say, those are questions for the engineer, or really for any scientist, whatever field we're looking at, if we're looking at medicine, right, how, you know, what's the best way to minimize uh, heart attacks or to engage in some sort of life-saving surgery and whatever. Those are all questions for the scientist because it's basically, here's a problem, solve it, right? Now, what's very important when we are discussing these, uh, the, the, these problems or the technological problem more fundamentally is that <laughs> we're not really talking about, well, what else could we do? <laughs> we're just saying if all you need to do, you have one task and that's to build the most durable bridge on the planet, right? <laughs> Forget about what all the other resources could do. How are you going to do it, right? That's not the most important question, right? Because we live in a world of scarcity, right? <laughs> uh, if you devote more resources, if you devote more cement, if you devote more construction workers to building, to adding something onto the interstate highway system, that means that those workers, that cement, those construction equipment and so on, they can't produce something else, right, during that time. 
Same thing with transporting goods. If you construct uh, a fleet of planes or a fleet of ships to transport goods from the West Coast to the East Coast, then all the resources that went into them, they can't be used for something else. So the engineer might tell you, well, the best way, the quickest way <laughs> uh, to transport goods from California to New York is we send a giant rocket ship up into space and then it goes back down and it'll take an hour or something. I don't know. Um, and that might be <laughs> the fastest way. The issue is it, it will cost a lot of money, right? So uh, what we really care about as economists, really, and, and just the, the more fundamental problem we could say is an economic one. It's the economic problem. It's what is the most highly valued allocation of the means, right? You know, we have scarce means and they can satisfy only so many ends. They can build only so many bridges, build only so many trains, build only so many iPads. What's the most optimal com uh, combination that satisfies our most highly ranked ends? So when we think about the technological problem, is it economical? to develop the fastest form of transportation from the West Coast to the East Coast? Is it economical to construct the most durable bridge possible? Is it economical to maximize the production of iPads in a given period of time? All right. <laughs> uh, a lot of engineers, a lot of scientists, they'll, they'll kind of look at you and say, well, we don't deal with that, right? They might be thinking about their given technology, their given plan, and they say that, well, what I'm developing is the most important thing on the planet. So that means if, if I don't get the resources I need, this is some sort of grave injustice, right? If we're not building the fastest bullet train to take us from uh, you know, one continent to the next or something. Well, that means that we're, in, you know, we're, we're, we're inefficient, we're backwards, we're not as scientifically advanced as possible. And, and the economist would say, well, well, no, that's the wrong way of looking at it because you're not looking at the opportunity cost of the resources. What are the foregone alternatives of those resources? If we transport goods from the West Coast to the East Coast, well, as I've said before, that takes time, that takes labor, that takes land, that takes capital goods. What could those have done instead? What ends could those have been devoted to satisfying instead of transporting goods from the West Coast to the East Coast? Same thing with building a durable bridge, right? Uh, same thing with maximizing the production of iPads. We all have constraints, so to speak. This is the world that we live in, right? So, what else could the scarce means produce? Right? Is it more highly valued? Right? That's really the question that we care about as economists, um, especially as Austrian economists. Right? So if the, end, if, excuse me, if the technological problem could be solved by an engineer, just, all right, what's the, what's the, the best way of doing something given our state of technological knowledge? Well, the economic problem, as we'll see, at least in modern societies, must be solved by the entrepreneur. Because the entrepreneur might learn from various inventors or various people that they employ that, well, this is the best way of building uh, a new car, right? Or building a new bridge or building a new, um, some, some new type of smartphone or whatever. The entrepreneur is going to say, is that actually profitable, right? Is it, does it actually make sense for us to do that? Right? And I want to I want to discuss this in more depth because this is this is really quite fundamental. So when people sort of denigrate, they they downplay the entrepreneur. That's just because they don't understand the economic problem. They don't understand that we live in a world of scarcity, right? All right. So how can we solve the economic problem? Right. Fundamentally, let's step back a little bit. Let's step back from a world of bridges and iPads and uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, and so on, right? There are two ways of solving the economic problem. The first way is valuation. I want to discuss what we mean by valuation. And the second way is economic calculation. Those are two, the only two ways, how we can solve the economic problem. And as we will see, so I'm going to define what valuation and economic calculation are in more depth. I already had mentioned kind of economic calculation. As we will see, valuation is applicable only in a very limited uh, number of situations. 
and it cannot solve the economic problem for market economies. So mar uh, valuation is, is quite limited. So really, we're left with economic calculation. Um, <clears throat> all right. So where might valuation apply? Right. Let's start with that. So we're going to start with a simple economy. Suppose uh, we are investigating Robinson Crusoe. So <laughs> you're probably wondering, like, what is, what, is it, what is with Austrian economists and Robinson Crusoe? I got to say, it's honestly a great book. It came out, you know, over, it came out in, like, I think, 1719 or something. It's a great book. It's actually quite readable. Um, have you ever seen Cast Away with Tom Hanks? It's basically that. But it's some guy, he's, he's, he's stuck on a desert island. He's, he's quite impoverished. He has to live this hand-to-mouth existence. And uh, he's faced with scarcity. And that's just a, a really great way to describe the, the basic principles of economics. So I was trying to find a picture of Robinson Crusoe. I found an AI-generated version of Robinson Crusoe. Here he is. <laughs> um, I don't know if the AI has actually read the book because Robinson Crusoe, it looks pretty nice actually. He's on an island, look at this. There's actually a ship in the background. You didn't have a ship. Uh, there's this, it looks quite tropical. He looks quite good. I mean, he, he reminds me of myself, but he's, he's, quite, <laughs> he's quite buff. He's got a six pack. Apparently on this island they have a gym and they also have a GNC and some other stuff. So he's doing quite well. All right, now in reality, Robinson Crusoe was not doing uh, uh, this good. He did not look like Fabio and all this stuff, and, and just, uh, he's, he's sort of beautiful. So let's say Robinson Crusoe has five ends, right? He, he just got back from the gym uh, on his island. He has five ends, and each requires one hour. So he could forage for berries. He could spend some time searching for berries to eat. He could build shelter, some sort of primitive hut or whatever. Uh, he could start a fire for warmth when it gets colder uh, later uh, in the day. He could construct a fishing net, uh, say, to, um, to, to, to eat fish and, and, and so on. Uh, or he could make a toothbrush, right, because he's got he's to keep up his, his hygiene. Um, <clears throat> um, but let's say he only has three hours left in the day. All he can do is expend three uh, hours of labor left. And that's it, right? So we have a very simple sort of value scale. These are the rankings. So what's he going to do? How will Robinson Caruso sort of solve his economic problem? He's got scarce means to labor, but he's got competing ends. And he's got, he's, he's, he can't satisfy all of those ends, right? So, so what, uh, what will he do, all right? So Caruso will engage in valuation. This is how he will solve the economic problem. So what I mean by this is valuation is allocating means according to their ability to satisfy ends, according to their ability to directly satisfy an end. Basically, just figuring out, OK, um, I have these means. What ends will they satisfy? And which ends do I value the most? So he can figure out the opportunity cost by basically just estimating, all right, the opportunity cost of a means is the foregone end that could be satisfied. So when it comes to, say, foraging for berries, uh, the opportunity cost would be uh, building a shelter, right? Because that's the next most highly valued choice. If it comes to building a shelter, right? If, if he says, well, I'm just going to start off building a shelter, well, then what would be the opportunity cost? If he hasn't satisfied the end of, 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 of getting berries, that's going to be the opportunity cost, right? Because that's a more highly valued end. So you're only going to act if you think that the choice uh, that you're currently engaged in, the end that you will receive is greater than the end that you could have satisfied, right? So you're trying to satisfy the most highly ranked end, all right? All right. So in Crusoe's case, with three hours, he will satisfy the top three ends. Right? It's, it's just a simple example. Uh, he's going to forage for berries. He's going to build a shelter. He's going to start a fire. Those are his most highly ranked ends. He's going to estimate. It's going to be a pretty easy estimation. OK, this is uh, how I want to allocate my labor. All right. So that's valuation. It, it works for Robinson Crusoe. Um, again, it's, 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 as we'll see, it's not the best life, though the, the AI picture kind of shows otherwise. But then again, what does the machine know? Um, so uh, what are some of the limitations of this approach? Well, valuation only works when the number of means are limited. We're looking at very few factors of production, right? Labor, not that many capital goods at all, not that many types of natural resources. Production processes are, are quite simple and short. So in Dr. Herbner's talk, we, we started to learn about 
the length of production processes. We'll discuss more the stages of production, right? Uh, building a, a fishing net uh, or some sort of spear to, 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 to throw into the, into the water, that's quite simple, right? It's, it's a lot simple, more simple, and it's gonna take less time than, say, building a car, right? And there's little division of labor, right? There's, there's a little specialization. Right, the, the Robinson Crusoe, he's kind of forced to just do everything on his own, right? So basically, valuation is applicable to isolated individuals, right? This is Castaway. This is Tom Hanks in Castaway. He's talking to a volleyball. Uh, that's how isolated he is. He's quite lonely. Uh, it's Wilson. He's screaming at him. Um, so <laughs> it can work for him. Tom, uh, Tom Hanks engaged in valuation, right? It can also work in very uh, primitive barter slash command economies. So very types of simple exchange. Uh, in the book, Friday comes along, and then Robinson Crusoe, he starts to work with Friday, so someone else. You can barter. You basically exchange for goods you directly value. Or some sort of very, very simple uh, primitive kind of command society. There's a couple of huts. And uh, all right, you've got some people, they're going to hunt animals and eat the animal and then use the skin for clothing and so on. Um, the important thing is, is this is all quite low standards of living, right? It's a very, very simple, um, it's, 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 a, it's a quite basic uh, living standard, nothing, nothing like what we have in the modern world. And the difficulty of valuation increases until it basically becomes impossible or in, inapplicable as people increase and production becomes more complex. You've got more people, so you've got division of labor. Production becomes more complex. There's more means. There's longer production processes. Uh, the, 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 there, there's multiple stages and so on. It, it gets harder and harder to allocate means according to their ability to directly satisfy ends because you might be building a capital good that isn't going to directly satisfy an end. It's going to build another capital good and then build another capital good and then eventually build a consumer good that will then uh, be used to satisfy an end. All right. So valuation is, is quite limited. And um, as we'll see, even in modern economies, we, of course, allocate goods according to how they directly satisfy our ends. But this isn't the only thing we actually take consideration of. Right. So let's look at a modern economy. Uh, suppose we're looking at an entrepreneur. Oh, we've got the Monopoly man. Uh, this, is my, this is my kind of person, right? Uh, seems like a good guy. All right, so uh, what can our entrepreneur uh, do? Well, he has, let's say, a plot of land to build any of the following. Uh, he could use the land to build a gated community with houses. He could use that land to build a, some sort of computer firm that produces computers or computer-related products. Uh, he could build a high-end mall, right, um, uh, with storefront and all of that, uh, or some sort of forested park, plant some trees, throws a couple benches there with some people's names on it, maybe a statue, uh, whatever. Um, he doesn't directly value any of these. Right? He doesn't, none of these ends, they're, they're not going to, these goods are not going to satisfy any of his ends. Valuation is not really helpful here, right? The entrepreneur, he's not really going to be able to estimate the opportunity cost of, uh, uh, of, of using land for one of the following, right, for, for one of his four options. So he, he won't be able to just uh, engage in valuation. He's going to have to use something else. All right, so what will he use? Well, he will rely on economic calculation. That's what he's going to do. He's going to rely on economic calculation to make his choice, all right? So economic calculation, as I mentioned before, is allocating means according to the monetary return uh, they generate in various production processes, the monetary returns, uh, and so on, right? So he's going to figure out, OK, I need to allocate land. And of course, there's other factors of production. He can't, you know, to, in order to build any of what he said, you know, there's going to any of what I said, excuse me. He's going to have to get land. He's going to have to get capital goods uh, and so on. Um, but he's going to decide, all right, well, which one is going to generate the most amount of money for me? Right? Now, economic calculation requires monetary calculation. Some people have argued, well, can't you um, engage in economic calculation not using a monetary return but some other cardinal magnitude, right, like certain goods uh, or labor, labor hours and so on? The issue is you can't because they're, they're not commensurate. You have different types of goods and different types of labor, skill, and so on. You have to use money. 
because one dollar is equal to one dollar, right? We, we spend one dollar somewhere else, someone can accept that one dollar and so on. Uh, money is the present good par excellence. We can use it to buy um, uh, uh, various goods and we all want money. Um, we all work for money so we can buy goods, right? So economic calculation requires monetary calculation. It requires computing the cost of production, right? How much it costs to say build the gated community and so on. Uh, how much revenue they'll earn from say the gated community, from the computer firm, from the, um, uh, the high-end mall and so on. Uh, and the resultant rate of return, right? So we can basically say profits. This is of course simplified because uh, we're not looking at interest return, but we're just saying profits, simple revenue greater than costs. Uh, and losses mean that revenue are, are less than costs, right? So uh, the entrepreneur is going to want to figure out, all right, well, of all my choices, which one are going to generate me the most amount of profit, right? And, and, and that's what he's going to go off of, okay? So to return to our example, right, suppose our entrepreneur estimates the following, right? These aren't ranked at all. They're just A, B, C, and D. Uh, so let's say, show me the money, right? Gated community, $10 million in profit. Computer firm, $55 million in profit. High-end mall, $35 million in profit. Forested park, $50,000 loss, right? Um, it's just, just, again, what people are gonna spend money on. It's just, it's just not as good, okay? So the entrepreneur, of course, he might not know this opedictically. He's just estimating this. He's estimating, okay, what have other gated communities generated? Uh, you know, people, you know, what's the state of consumer demand elsewhere? He's looking at the past. He's using that as trying to use it for his estimate of the future and so on. The entrepreneur has estimated his opportunity costs and he uses the land to make a computer firm, right? Any other choice generates a lower rate of return, right? So this is from the entrepreneur's perspective, right? He wants to maximize uh, the amount of money he makes so that way he can spend his money elsewhere. Right. Even if the entrepreneur really loves one of these things, oh, all I've wanted to do is run a forest, like run my own park. Well, uh, the, the monetary sign, the monetary signal is going to tell him uh, that, that, that it's going to cost you money. And you might say, well, you know, I, I love parks, but I don't love losing $50,000 every year or something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> and we all do this, as I've said. We all use monetary signals when making our decisions. Coming to Mises University, well, maybe you were working. Would you have to take time off work? Deciding to major in something. Well, how much money am I going to estimate? Uh, excuse me, how much money do I estimate I can earn uh, from this major as opposed to something else? And so on and so forth. We, we live in a world of monetary prices. Right? We, we can't escape economic calculation in the world we're in. All right. So why do monetary returns matter? All right, so why is this important from the perspective of society, we could say? Well, on the free market, monetary returns reflect how much consumers value goods. Because consumers decide what to spend their money on and what not to. Are they going to buy a new computer? Are they going to live in a gated community? Are they going to buy a clothes at a mall? Are they going to take their family to a park? The market price system really indirectly transforms qualitative value rankings into quantitative magnitudes. It's very important. Utility is ordinal, as we've discussed. Um, and really, it's the, it's the price system. Is, it's an indirect transformation uh, where we're able to actually uh, sort of figure out, OK, how much consumers are preferring something or when we're looking at, say, multiple consumers. Because if multiple consumers are deciding to live in a gated community, that's going to mean multiple consumers want to demand that good. And that's going to lead to higher prices for homes in a gated community, right? And that's a cardinal magnitude. You can see the prices. You can see the profit. The entrepreneur will be able to see this, estimate this, and so on. And then they will be able to make a decision based on that. So if an entrepreneur estimates that they can earn the most profits uh, building a computer firm, right, selling computer products, using their land for that, uh, that means, in a fundamental sense, consumers value it more than the alternatives. Right? Because consumers are willing to spend more of their money. More consumers or just a given consumer is ranking uh, computer products more high, like higher on their value scale compared to the alternative goods. Right? This is a very, very important uh, uh, point. 
And we really can't stress this enough because profits and loss are quite good from the perspective of uh, society. Profits mean that businesses are producing things that consumers value. Losses mean that businesses are doing the opposite. They are wasting resources. All right. So just to sort of uh, summarize with this, uh, when building a computer firm, that means the entrepreneur allocates uh, the land and other factors to the most highly valued end, right? We can think of this, um, uh, what society values us the most, and of course, what the entrepreneur wants, because the entrepreneur wants money. More money means they will be able to uh, buy more goods to satisfy their own ends, right? This is, uh, so this is, this is quite important. This is the, the social appraisement process uh, as Dr. Salerno has, 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 has described it before, right? Of sort of the objective assessments of, 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 of what people are willing to spend their money on, right? And, and the, the, the significance of this, right? So we know that the entrepreneur can do this, the monopoly man, he can engage in economic calculation. All right, let's introduce government. So we're not gonna get to socialism yet, but we're gonna move sort of along a spectrum, if you will. Right. Can governments engage in economic calculation? This, we might say, is a more fundamental problem, or at least a more uh, relevant problem for the world we live in, because we're not in a socialist society. Um, we're in a mixed economy, right? Uh, the United States, or whatever country you are from. Uh, so can governments engage in economic calculation? The answer is no. At best, kind of, but definitely less than markets, but just no. Right? That, 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 I think that's a, that's a better way of putting it. So to see why, we can consider uh, the following. So if a business wants to build and operate a road, right, it, it's going to have to estimate some things. I'm, I'm choosing a good, like a road. This is a traditional public good that we assume, well, governments, who will build the roads? Right? Can you engage in, is economic calculation applicable to building a road? Right? And, and this, is, this is people building a road, I guess. Right? Uh, they got the, all the stuff, they got the workers, they got the tar, they got the, the little rolling machines, whatever. Uh, they got some brushes, I think, and anyway. All right, uh, so they're going to have to estimate how much money the road will generate through tolls. Right? When people go on the road, use Easy Pass or Sun Pass or something else. Uh, they're going to raise money from other businesses. We'll talk about this for a little bit. Because uh, this is actually how a lot of private roads were built in the past. They're going to estimate how much commerce it will generate to nearby businesses. Right? A, a, a new highway that um, enables uh, people to get more quickly to uh, a mall, uh, that's going to lead to people going to the mall more. It might cut down travel time by from 40 minutes to 20 minutes. That's, that's a big difference. And then, of course, how much money it will generate to property owners, right? Nearby homes, other property, they're going to experience a boost in the value of their real estate because now people and goods will be able to get to and fro places more quickly. So uh, they estimate all this. They estimate their costs. And if it's profitable, the transportation business will allocate means accordingly. And a lot of roads back in the day, both in the United States, especially in the United States, but also in England when you had private roads and turnpikes, uh, they, you had a, a transportation company raising money, expecting to make money from tolls, and then you also had nearby businesses and property owners uh, invest in the road. They were sort of like a combined sort of entrepreneurial venture because a, a town would want a new road uh, coming through that town uh, because that would generate more business for them, right? And some roads will be built, some roads won't be built. It's estimating opportunity cost. All right, let's introduce the government. All right, so let's say the government's going to build the roads, right, which often happens in the world we live in. The government can't really estimate whether building and operating the road will be profitable, whether it will be, um, they'll, it'll make money, and then consequently whether it will be the best use of the scarce resources. Why? Because the government will, will rely on taxation for most of the money that it makes. In fact, for most roads, there aren't any tolls charged. For some roads, there are tolls, but most of the money they'll use, at least to pay factors of production initially, will come from taxes, and then to maintain the road year in and year out, maintenance and so on, will come from taxes. And taxes uh, are coerced levies generated outside of the price system, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, two things in life are certain, death and taxes. Taxes are outside of the price system. You're forced to pay them, 
Right? The only way you can is if you, you leave the country, but that's not really a voluntary choice, we would say, uh, at least I would argue, fundamentally. So this means that the government's construction will not be according to consumer desires, and instead it will be according to political or some sort of vote-mongering considerations. All right, does the government official want a road because it's going to be named the, the Henry Clay Road? or uh, you know, something else, or, or is it, well, we need to have this road go through here because I need these, um, uh, I need these people to vote for me in the election. That, 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 that's outside of the price system. Right? So what this means fundamentally is there is a tendency for what Austrians, especially Murray Rothbard, has called calculational chaos. All right? Calculational chaos, what do I mean by that? It's the inability to solve the economic problem and the consequent misallocation of means. It's as if the signals are getting jammed, so to speak. They can't do it as well as an entrepreneur. They might get it right some of the times. They might do it right. Initially, we could talk about, say, the Erie Canal you know, um, uh, and, and some other examples um, looked at. But really, they're, they're ultimately going to misallocate means. The tendency is for them to misallocate factors of production and to not um, uh, adequately solve the economic problem. So the roads we see uh, in, in uh, the society we live in, there, there tends to be calculational chaos, a misallocation of means. Right? Certainly you can understand there's a misallocation of means when, say, it's, it's a busy time and they're doing maintenance on the road and uh, <laughs> is, is this the right time to do it, really? Like it couldn't be done at 3 in the morning or something like that. That's what I always think to myself. All right, so uh, wrapping up here, we come to socialism. Capitalism is an economic system where the factors of production are privately owned. All right? That's really fundamentally what capitalism is, private ownership, voluntary exchange of things that are privately owned and so on, concentrating on uh, the private ownership of factors of production. And socialism is basically the opposite. It's an economic system where factors of production are centrally owned right? by Uncle Sam or by the government. All right? Um, <clears throat> this is fundamentally what socialism refers to. Socialism really referred to communism. We think of socialism now as a mixed economy. That's different. Right? Uh, egalitarianism related to socialism, equal distribution of, of property or even authoritarian, the bent of socialism, that's all sort of, uh, um, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's almost secondary to this uh, fundamental point. So socialist uh, utopia, uh, utopians, um, said that, well, socialism, like uh, guys like Karl Marx, uh, is a higher stage in mankind's development than capitalism. Everything's going to be great, right? Everything will be perfect. It will be better than capitalism. We better. We got flying cars. We got uh, cool sorts of spaceships. People are still walking their dogs on leashes, apparently. But we've got all of this stuff going on. Everything's great. Um, and what's the response to this? Well, the classical economists, uh, their response was, who will take out the trash? It's the incentive problem. Okay. And this is an important problem. It's how are you going to incentivize people to do the difficult jobs, right? You take out the trash, notice uh, the woman, she has a mask on because it probably smells, it's not healthy, right, whatever. Uh, people who take out trash, they get paid more. It's a compensating wage differential. Uh, if um, a neurosurgeon gets paid the same amount as a janitor, well, who's going to perform brain operations, right? Like, um, you know, how are we going to do this? <clears throat> so. The, the, the socialist's response was, we'll have a new economic man, a new man. A new man? No. Uh, a, new, a new economic man, right? Uh, just this, this, this perfect socialist person that will be vibed with all the correct propaganda. They'll be able to rotate between jobs. We'll get rid of division of labor. Uh, they'll accept everything. It's all great. That was the response. It's like, well, all right, I guess that's taken care of. Right? Now, of course, the incentive problem is still enormously important. But Mises. In starting an economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth, basically said, <laughs> even with that, even with the right incentives, how can the central planner solve the economic problem? And Mises basically bends over backwards to accommodate his critics. He'll say, well, look, you can, you can have a private market in consumer goods. You can have the central planner. They know all the consumer goods to produce. You can give them all of the knowledge of the means. They know all of the labor. They know all of the land. They know the technology. They have all of this stuff. Even with all of that, how can you allocate the means to the most highly ranked ends without monetary prices? 
That was his point. And he said, you can't do it. Without money, you cannot estimate opportunity costs. There would be total calculational chaos. The entire system would collapse. A modern socialist economy is impossible. This is what he means by impossible. You can have a socialist society for a very primitive uh, world, right? The pictures of the couple of farms in the back, something like that, those have existed in society. Mises has mentioned that. He said, yep, those can exist. But for a modern society, you cannot have socialism. The USSR, when it was originally started, or really after the Bolsheviks took power, they tried to get rid of money, nationalized everything. It was called war communism. The entire economy collapsed, right? Lenin had to sort of backtrack. We'll talk a little bit about this, okay? So socialism cannot work. You have to have monetary prices. You have to be able to estimate profits and loss or the thing, it, it, it just won't work. And this was Mises' basically it was his mic drop. He's like, all right, there you go. And there was a big socialist calculation debate, but as we'll see, they, they were not able to really adequately confront Mises' objections, right? The socialist response is, oh, okay, well, uh, we can't have, uh, we can't have, the, um, uh, we can't have money or prices, sorry, we can't, we can't have no money, right? Uh, we can't have money or prices, but we can play market and create firms that buy and sell uh, from each other. So we're just gonna have imaginary markets, right? And this is really kind of the response to Mises. And Mises, as well as uh, another famous Austrian, um, uh, his, his, uh, we could say his, his student, his informal student, F.A. Hayek, was saying, is, is this real socialism? Like, is, is this actually socialism anymore? You're now having fake markets, buying and selling firms run by the government that are buying and selling everything from each other. Uh, are these actually real prices? Right? The, the, the government's going to set the prices, and then it's going to figure out, well, when there's a shortage or a surplus, and then it's going to adjust the price. Is, is, this, is this a real price? Are they actually going to do that right? Uh, are these real firms? Can these firms go bankrupt? Can these firms merge with other firms? Can these firms, you know, can, can, can firms break apart? Right? Uh, the capitalist entrepreneur is completely absent. Uh, in all of these uh, discussions. This is Mises' point. It's like this, uh, Mises and Hayek are saying, well, this isn't even socialism anymore. It still can't work, but you, you, you've basically conceded the fundamental point, right? So the bottom line here, at the end of the day, socialism is impossible. It can't solve the economic problem. Again, important footnote for modern societies, but basically for any society we would care to live in. It cannot solve the economic problem. This is why um, the war communism of the Soviet Union basically collapsed early on, right? Real world socialism has only existed right, in extremely primitive societies, right, that support very low living standards, very low uh, population growth, and so on. In a world of capitalism, external market prices, so the socialist, um, say the USSR, was able to look at external market prices um, and decide, okay, well, is that economical? Is that not? So they're, <laughs> and, and they are able to buy and sell goods from abroad. So it's still very inefficient. It still was very inefficient, but they're kind of able to do it. And then in, a, um, in, in uh, these socialist economies, they have black markets, underground markets, and some form of money, some form of unit of account, uh, and some form of, of limited private property. Right? So the USSR um, had very low living standards. It wasn't extremely primitive, but it was quite low compared to the United States. It exists in a world of capitalism, and it had black markets, a lot of corruption, uh, to, you know, bribery to facilitate those black markets, some form of money and some form of private property, right? That's real world socialism, right? Yeah, Mises', Mises is pointing, it has not been refuted. It cannot be refuted, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, summing up. The success of capitalism is based on the ability of entrepreneurs to engage in economic calculation. This is why we say capitalism works, because entrepreneurs are able to use the price system and, 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 and estimate consumer demands to decide how they're going to best allocate scarce resources. This is why it works. Right? Government intervention introduces bits of calculational process. Uh, a a, a government-run enterprise, even a subsidized business, 
the tax funds, the taxpayer funds, it, 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 it screws up the process because the, the money is generated outside of the price system. Right, this is very important. Right, so capitalism works, government intervention kind, kind of, government intervention doesn't work. Right, it's not like total chaos, but it's like, eh. Right, it's, I'd rather have a private road. And then socialism results in total calculational chaos. The, the system just collapse, collapses at best. It, it uses some form of the market, and then it just kind of ekes out in existence. Right? And this makes it impossible. So this is a, these are very important um, uh, conclusions of Austrian economics. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Austrian economics needs to be uh, the, the teachings of Austrian economics need to continue to be spread uh, because if we forget this, we're going to end up with socialism and we're going to end up with total calculational chaos. So I think I will end here. I don't have time for questions, but thank you so much uh, for your time. <laughs>